Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lorelai Kelly, and I'd like to welcome you to the New America Foundation uh, to what we hope will be the first in a series of discussions about the United States Congress and 21st century democracy. This first session is called Congress 2.0. How is Congress coping with the information revolution? For those of you watching on the web, New America is a nonprofit and nonpartisan public policy institute in Washington, D.C. that looks to new ideas and new thinkers to address the next generation of challenges facing the United States. A mission that we embrace here through 15 programs that cover everything from counterterrorism to poverty reduction and from education to economic growth. We are also growing. We have headquarters here and a presence in California and New York. I am leading an exploratory project here called Smart Congress. I'm, I love it when people don't laugh when I say that. <laughs> it's not an oxymoron, it doesn't have to be. Um, and I'm part of a team housed within the New America Foundation's Open Technology Institute, which supports open networks and open source innovations. On this project, we've been examining how the changing technological landscape is impacting how Congress as an institution receives, sorts, and filters information during the policymaking process. I'd like to say thank you to the philanthropies who have supported the research for this effort over the past two years. Those are the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So let's get to Congress. I don't need to elaborate, but everyone in this room knows that Congress is looking pretty unappealing these days. Its popularity ratings are hitting new lows. People, and especially candidates, often speak of a disconnect between Americans and Washington, D.C. We often witness unhelpful partisanship, undemocratic participation within the institution, and incivility that can't possibly help the institution thrive or move forward. Yet, another important disconnect that I think people here in D.C. know about needs to be emphasized. Congress is full of smart and dedicated people working on both sides of the aisle. They are working to serve the public interest with long hours and comparatively little pay. They are also working with historically low levels of staffing, Ex especially this is true with long-term expert policy personnel. I think another important question here is how do we help Congress as an institution? How do we optimize this implicit desire of our legislature to serve the greater good? If we take a holistic approach, can we possibly create some room for discussion based on empathy, dare I say, empathy for Congress? <laughs> because it is really an amazing and a durable creation. It's the first branch of government, and it should be the most technologically savvy, the closest to the American people, and the most innovative in delivering new forms and learning, uh, of learning and democratic practice. In my own opinion, I really feel like the US Congress should be the centerpiece of the global town square. How do we make it that way? In many ways, our obsolete legislature reflects the challenges faced by populations around the world. Citizen expectations have outpaced government's abilities to provide meaningful opportunities to participate in building a common future. We aim to dive right into this challenge here at the New America Foundation, and our three panelists that I have here with me today are terrifically equipped to start this conversation. I'm going to start on my right with Susie Gordon. She's got years of experience as a staff person on Capitol Hill, and she's now vice president at the Congressional Management Foundation, um, which has got a wonderful website, and I'll let you announce that. I'm going to limit this bio because a lot of this bio information is online. What they do basically is provide continuing education for the institutional needs of Congress. It is beloved by staff across both parties, and because of its steady dedication to helping all of those who work there, most recently, it has been looking at the impacts of social media on Congress and Congress as a workplace, and Susie will, will talk about that. Um, second here, we have Tom Halloran, who just uh, arrived yesterday from New York, who's a tech entrepreneur and co-founder of a company called IB5K. We recently met at Personal Democracy Forum in New York. I don't know how to explain PDF. It's kind of like an Eric-conditioned Lollapalooza for tech geeks. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, organization, and they have a newsletter called Tech President, which is must read every day um, if you want to learn about the intersection of policy and uh, government and technology. Uh, Tom uh, is going to 
address the technical sorting and filtering challenges of Congress, as well as their new platform, which is called Correlate, which provides an innovative communications analysis tool for member offices. And then uh, third will be Jessica Lee, who's a national security expert, and she's pr presently on the personal staff of Congressman Jim McDermott of Washington. He's a Democrat. And he's, she was formerly a professional staff member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. This is important, these two hats that she's played on Capitol Hill, because her experience in both of these roles is instructive. I think she can offer us an important perspective about in, uh, institutional information sharing, uh, what we call the information asymmetry problem within the institution. Uh, and in this case, where committees tend to get the deep uh, substance, whereas personal staffs tend to get more sentiment. Um, and how do we start to create a, a more symmetrical knowledge sharing environment for Congress? Um, the, 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 the examples there would be the difference between sort of opinion polls and peer reviewed data. And, and at the end of the panel, I'm going to ask Nancy Lubin, who's sitting in the audience, to offer some brief comments. Nancy is, is head of JNA Associates today. Today, She is an expert on the former Soviet Union, and it's in that capacity. She was a project director at the Office of Technology Assessment, which is now defunct, but it was once the world's premier scientific advisory body for legislators. Uh, before um, we start, though, I'd also like to mention that this event is being live streamed on the web, and everything is on the record forever. <laughs> so just to keep that in mind, um, for those of you on Twitter, please use the hashtag, hashtag OTISC. We've got it up in the room as well to ask questions during the panel and Q&A. And also, during the Q&A, please wait for the microphone. Todd, uh, my colleague here, has the microphone, and he'll bring it to you. And um, as I mentioned, we have an online audience for this event, and so we want to make sure they can hear um, as well. And I'll go ahead and start with Susie, if you'd like to go ahead, and, and then we'll just move down, and Nancy, and then we'll open it up for a discussion. Thank you for coming today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, recorded forever, uh, no pressure <laughs> there at all. So uh, thanks for that excellent introdu um, introduction. Um, so I am Susie Gordon. I'm the Vice President of the Congressional Management Foundation. As Laurel, I said, we've been around helping Congress, particularly on the staffer side, but also working directly with members as well uh, for 35 years. Uh, I was going to do a slide presentation, but instead I'm going to go back to old fashioned. Uh, so just to give you a sense of how long that is, how long we've been around, and talking about quite a few of the things we're talking about today. This is an early flyer from 1978. You can see we have a very groovy uh, logo up top, uh, very 70s and swinging. And it says, in confusion about computers. And it has a little uh, advertisement. And it's talking um, about how staff can come and learn about how to deal with technology. So uh, this is nothing new to the organization. Um, but to get in, you know, dive into a little bit of the substance, uh, we were working, um, so we are a 501c3. Um, we're nonprofit, nonpartisan. Um, our tagline used to be better, ma um, better government through better management. Uh, we have really done a lot of research looking at how constituents communicate with Congress and how they can do so more effectively because that's the other half of the equation, obviously. And um, so we have, we've um, changed our tagline more recently to talk about uh, building trust and effectiveness in Congress. Also can be a laugh line given the, uh, depending on the audience um, because um, they're not seen as particularly trustworthy or effective right now, but we really do believe, as Lorelai said, we kicked it off, we hit it off right away when we first started talking because we're big believers in the institution. And we really do think um, it's there to serve the people and that there are amazing people working there. So uh, my shorthand frequently is that we're wonks for wonks, if you will. So uh, that's another way we see ourselves. Um, but looking at some of the research that we've done, um, we had some grants from the National Science Foundation and from Pew, and um, again, I'll pass this around, but uh, because if you can look above us, that would have been the, uh, that would have been the screen projector, and that wouldn't really have worked with the panel. <laughs> exactly, yeah, we'll, we'll just mix it all up. We, um, we'll, we'll cover the gamut. Um, you can see the increase in constituent mail that, mail that the congressional offices are having to deal with. Senate, House, and at a high in 2009, an 865% increase in email from 2002 to 2009. Um, on the Senate side. To put that into perspective, keep in mind that the congressional staff sizes, the average hasn't changed since 1974, with an average of 18 in the House, over on the House side. Or actually, I'm not sure if that covers both, because the Senates are obvious, the Senate sizes are quite a bit larger. 
Um, again, trying to put this into perspective, Godfather 2 was, um, was hitting the theaters. We were in the middle of a different gas crisis where you could only get gas if you had an even number of license plates on certain days. Um, and Gerald Ford was in the White House. So keep in mind that we are talking about a huge explosion with very limited resources to deal with that increase. Um, it's great that I'm sitting next to our friend Tom from IB5K because they're actually part of the solution. Way back before I started with um, Congressional Management Foundation, I had a very odd job. Um, I was working for one of the vendors who gets the, um, who works with associations, trade associations, nonprofits, advocacy groups to send form emails up to the, um, up to members of Congress. I had the unenviable job of trying to convince members of Congress that that wasn't spam. At that time, that's how they saw it broadly, and they were turning it off. They said, not only are we not interested, we actively see this as a bad thing, and we are not going to respond to these emails at all. And in fact, we're not even going to acknowledge that we received them. So that's the, that was the environment in 2005. Literally saw it as spam. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Tom, and I'm happy to elaborate on some more of our role in moving the technology along and some of the other challenges and uh, my perspective from working on the Hill as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so that's actually a great introduction, um, a great segue, thank you. Uh, the, um, we are, so IB5K is a, is a for-profit uh, startup. We, we started after, at, at 2009, or 2009 after the Obama campaign. My partner was, uh, was involved in the new media group of, uh, of uh, OFA, and uh, um, I did not have a political background. My background is in academic computing. Um, but um, but there were some interesting um, interesting problems that uh, that he was um, get, getting asked about when he you know was living in Washington um, and uh, and taking a lot of meetings and um, it became uh, th this is around the same time as uh, this report the communicating with Congress report that uh, the Dem uh, the Congressional Management Foundation came out with um, uh, one of the many. There, this, this report was released over many years, but, but one of the, the, the more comprehensive um, components of this report was released at about the same time as we were, um, as, as we were uh, starting to work on this problem of uh, constituent communication with um, uh, talking to Nancy Pelosi's office and talking to, at that point, um, the minority. Uh, and uh, um, and, uh, and it, it was clear that across the institution, uh, the tools that they were using, they're called uh, broadly outside of the house. Uh, this category of software tools is called um, a CRM, right? It's what you use to manage your customer relations. In the house, they're called uh, constituent, um, constituent mail management system, CMSs. Um, and uh, the, uh, so these tools uh, are, don't, the, the market is, is somewhat small. They don't innovate very quickly. And the, the slide that, um, that you just saw that shows the, the increase in email volume, um, the, 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 the way that offices solve this problem is just by adding staff, or the way that they could solve this problem is by adding staff, but as you heard, staff hasn't been added. So our, uh, our solution, what we call Correlate, sits on top of these, um, these CRMs and provides an analytical interface um, and a, a, an intuitive analytical interface that lets you filter um, with maps or um, a, by topic um, to allow for constituent services to still happen. Because um, the, uh, the other anecdote that you just heard is obviously a lot of the uptick in email um, volume comes from advocacy groups. So it's very important for offices to be able to distinguish between um, you know, email that they need for constituent services just in their capacity to carry out their responsibility to their constituents and um, and advocacy email. So our layer, our software layer, um, allows that to happen in a more transparent way. It's in use on both sides of, um, of the house in leadership, and we're working on, um, on integrating it more deeply with, with CRMs right now, and hopefully that will happen soon. Um, another project, though, that is actually um, the, that I, I see as the culmination of uh, a successful, but sometimes it seems slow, um, process of um, uh, institutional, not-for-profit, and for-profit collaboration to move the institution forward uh, is our work on what we call um, uh, the uh, 
CMF uh, specification for constituent email implementing that, so or uh, advocacy email, sorry, implementing this. So this is actually known by the. Uh, this is another laugh line. The term the the uh, the product is called the black box inside the house, um, but uh, the um, but. But this, this product, is an, it's an open API, an open XML API that allows for anyone to register. This, the, uh, initially, what are known as advocacy vendors, these groups that send massive amounts of advocacy email or allow groups to register to send advocacy email to Congress uh, in a more, um, instead of reverse engineering the constituent email pathway, it provides a, a standard email pathway for advocacy groups to send email to Congress. It doesn't overwhelm the mail servers. It doesn't um, break when a web form changes. So yeah, we, we're implementing an open API. We, yeah, so an application programming interface. So this is a standard method for, um, and, uh, and documented method for advocacy groups um, to send mail to the institution as opposed to going through a, a channel that wasn't built for this, which is the, the going at pretending as if they're a constituent effectively and, and sending mail that way. So we're, we're in the process of testing this and uh, hopefully it'll be rolled out for the, ne for the next, uh, the next um, Congress. And uh, that's really exciting. It's the culmination of years of, of work, um, but I think it's a good, it will end up being um, a, a, a good demonstration of how these different organizations can work together to move the institution forward. So I think that that's it for me, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, letting me speak uh, today. This is uh, such an important topic. Uh, I feel very strongly that this kind of di uh, discussion has to happen more in this town. Um, having only been here for four years, but uh, having seen very closely uh, and firsthand some of the, uh, the functions and inner workings of, of US Congress, I, I think uh, there's a lot we can do to get smart people like Tom and Susie to help us uh, to do our job better. Um, so maybe I'll just step back a little and just quickly introduce myself to like, give you a sense of what I did both on the committee and uh, in, in my current job. Um, so after I graduated from Harvard uh, graduate school where I studied Korean, um, the Korean Peninsula basically, um, and, and you know South Korea of course is the most internet has the most uh, penetration of internet uh, usage, I think, in, in the world or something like that. And, you know, Harvard has a lot of money. So that, again, you know, it was very easy to get information, lot largest libraries, uh, just information was literally in my fingertips. Um, moved on to DC uh, without a job and uh, found a job, uh, entry level job at the House Committee on Foreign Affairs working for the Democratic Chairman, uh, Howard Berman, uh, then was promoted to, uh, to handle his uh, Asia policy about a year later. Um, and um, about two and a half years ago when we lost the, the well, in November 2010, uh, when we lost the, um, the House uh, to the Republican Party, uh, many of us were let go, including myself. Um, and uh, then I transitioned over to Congressman Jim McDermott's personal office, where I handle his foreign policy, defense, uh, women's issues, veterans issues, and uh, uh, immigration. So lots of issues for just one person to cover. Uh, I think as Susie alluded to, it's uh, pretty uh, impossible uh, portfolios that a lot of the staff members on the Hill have to manage uh, and give you know, recommendations, defensible recommendations to their bosses who go on record to support uh, what you're re recommending them to do. So uh, very stressful job. Uh, and uh, so naturally our desire is to have the, the most qualified individuals uh, and, and the best information possible uh, in the personal office in order to serve our constituents' interest. On the committee, you, your job is to analyze uh, legislation that is being referred to that committee, uh, talk to stakeholders, talk to the administration, get a sense for what this bill seeks to do and how feasible it is. Uh, are the folks in the executive branch who will be implementing that bill on board? Do they have serious objections to it? Why? Uh, things like that. So you have to do all your homework and then try to uh, analyze that as those, uh, as those bills move. Uh, out of committee or members pressure the chairman or the ranking member to, to go ahead and move it out of committee. So uh, very different jobs. Um, so during Q&A, if you have any specific you know, questions on, on those, um, you know, those uh, my specific uh, roles uh, in the two offices, I'm happy to elaborate. But um, I know that the focus of today's discussion is on technology. So I thought I'd just quickly um, you know, g give you a sense of, of how technology has uh, impacted policymaking uh, in my current job uh, that I see. Um, so, you know, obviously Facebook, Twitter, blogs, they're out there, you know, members are on it, on it, they're tweeting and, you know, 
posting on Facebook, I would say overwhelming majority are, are, you know, of the stuff is, is policy, substantive stuff that they want to get the word out to their constituents to say, hey, this is what I did, you know, th this was my vote. I know you care about this issue, so, you know, this is, this is a statement for the record, this is my floor speech, you know, et cetera. So you, you, there's a lot of, you know, use of, of, I would say, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and, and you know, even blogs to, to you know, to present uh, their views uh, and reach the people more quickly than, you know, putting out a press release and, you know, kind of hoping that a, a media picks it up. So, you know, I think things are changing very rapidly on that front. Um, one of the things that I found very helpful um, about, you know, about all this is the ability for, you know, my member to, uh, to be part of the national discussion on a set issue. So for example, the Time Magazine ran a cover story uh, a couple of weeks ago on, on suicide in the US military and how um, you know, the Pentagon's uh, report in early June um, you know, revealed that you know, basically uh, there were one suicide a day among uh, US active uh, service members, which is an astounding number. Um, then uh, during the Defense Department's appropriations bill for FY13, uh, my boss was able to uh, put together an amendment uh, and, and go to the House floor and, and uh, explain what this amendment would do, which is to increase uh, suicide funding uh, in the def uh, Defense Department by $10 million. Um, and then when that amendment passed, uh, which we were very happy about, he uh, was contacted by Time Magazine and uh, actually was able to post on the Time Magazine's blog about his bill and the amendment, and and you know, it's, uh, you know, Jim McDermott's thing, and, and and you know, our office wrote it. It was on the Time Magazine blog, so people could kind of see, oh, there was a member of Congress who reacted to this issue and went and actually did something about it. That's pretty cool. Um, so you know, that I think is one way, uh, you know, in which um, technology is affording us the ability to really communicate much more rapidly and respond more quickly to some of the t uh, hot issues of the day. Um, I would say, in general, things that I love that really help me do my job in the personal office uh, is when I have experts who can distill for me the impact of an issue to the local district, the 7th District of Washington, or Washington State more broadly, so that my boss can explain to the people when he goes back every weekend that this issue it affects you this way. So for example, um, the best, uh, some of the best examples I can think of are um, you know, costofwar.com, uh, which is a website that breaks down how much U.S. taxpayer uh, dollars is being spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it breaks down by district and by state. So you can just go, and, and it separates by Iraq and Afghanistan. So I wonder how much 7th District of Washington spent in Afghanistan. You just click, click, boom, there's a number. Um, that's great. Uh, that stuff we can insert right into my member speech um, and things like that. Another example that comes to my mind is uh, a great report that Senator Harkin's staff at the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services um, put together uh, and released on June 25th that outlines the state-by-state -state impact of sequestration on domestic programs. Um, and so on Washington's, for Washington State, it would mean, for example, more than 2,000 children not receiving child care subsidies. So those are the kinds of breakdowns that really help us appreciate the meaning of, of some of these larger programs in the context of, uh, in the local context. Um, so I think those are uh, definitely worth mentioning. Um, I, I have some other examples, but, uh, and then I think, you know, it's important for members of Congress to also realize that technology goes both ways. Uh, it shouldn't be just about outside groups trying to influence Congress. Members also need to be smart about using technology and, and reaching out to, to uh, their constituents and other stakeholders. Um, you know, I was uh, surprised to read uh, the Lake Research Partner Survey, which just came out that said that, um, you know, Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group. Uh, they grew by 46% since 2000. But, uh, and 40% and of, of Asian Americans apparently rely on internet and social media to get uh, information and to disseminate information. Yet only 23% of Asian Americans said they've been contacted by the Democratic Party and only 17% by the Republican Party. So clearly, you know, technology is something that, you know, I think lawmakers and, and po politicians also need to uh, take more advantage of uh, and, and use uh, uh, more creatively uh, and in new ways. So, uh, I would just like to end by, by saying that, um, you know, I, I think there are, you know, a lot of uh, ways in which we can get, you know, kind of uh, focus too much on, on the problems, you know, but um, I, I do think also that uh, Congress is changing, uh, and, and I think 
uh, one of the books that you know every member of Congress and staff uh, ought to read uh, to appreciate how important Congress is for American democracy is uh, former Congressman Lee Hamilton's book uh, Strengthening Congress, in which he you know uh, explains very clearly, uh, based on his you know years of uh, work uh, serving in Congress, why a strong Congress is, is so critical to U.S. Uh, democracy. And so, um, you know, I, I think there are, are people having this very discussion uh, across the country. I think. Uh, it, it's now uh, kind of, you know, really maximizing uh, the, the experts and the resources we have and, and really making some, uh, you know, uh, concrete, uh, you know, input um, so that we can, you know, start to see, uh, to see some change. So happy to elaborate more later uh, during Q&A. Thank you. I want to sure. just add a note to what you just said, which is, I think, is something that we have more opportunity for. Uh, Congressman McDermott, uh, is a natural person to be a champion of the military uh, suicide problem mm -hmm. because he was deployed to Vietnam and mm -hmm. was a, is a doctor and was right. a psychiatrist, right? right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that's also very interesting. You have these super talented members and staff, and how do we help them become system-wide support systems for the institution? Um, and Dr. McDermott has always been a tremendous asset to that, having uh, been in meetings with them. Um, so th thank you for that. I, I wanted to turn now uh, to Nancy Lubin. Uh, if you would, Todd, uh, if you could give Nancy the microphone. She's going to just offer sort of first impressions and comments on our panel today. I found um, Nancy several years ago, actually, when I was working in Congress and bringing in outside experts who had really interesting on-the-ground experience in U.S. foreign policy national security. And one of the reasons I was brought in and I worked with a group of members was because Congress as an institution, as it sorts and filters these sort of big, complex global issues on national security, it's, some, it's stuck somewhere in the 40s, basically, where it sees the world um, it, it, where, uh, you know, the military is the go-to place for national security issues. Meanwhile, we've moved into far broader sets of concerns, much more complex and subtle and interdependent. Um, and what the members asked me to do was set up some convening mechanisms that shared issues between the foreign affairs and the armed services so we could touch on these big global implications like peacekeeping was one example, what was going on in the 90s. Um, things like uh, these civil military missions that our military was I engaged in, um, extreme weather events, uh, reconstruction after natural catastrophes, all kinds of things where what our personnel were actually experiencing didn't really match the agency's mission. So we had uh, a lot of convenings, hundreds of convenings underneath the committee system in an ad hoc uh, way sponsored by members, very well attended, perfectly bipartisan. I might add, too, today, lots of Republican interest on the Hill. First week of August after recess is not the greatest time <laughs> to get uh, Hill staff. So we were really lucky to get these folks. Um, but uh, in our future conversations, I'm sure we'll have both Democrats and Republicans up here. Um, but Nancy was, uh, the reason I, I feel like she's so important is she was an, a, a Soviet Union expert at the former Office of Technology Assessment, which was a, the global premier scientific advisory body. It's been replicated around the world. It is no longer in existence. But I think one of the most important things is that it provided expertise within the process of policymaking. And Nancy, if you just comment on wh what you've heard up here today and maybe a little bit about how the Office of Technology Assessment worked and are there uh, ways that that's being done today that we could look to? Um, well, first, thank you. I mean, it's been, uh, you know, this isn't real, the technology side isn't what I do <laughs> using this iPad for me as, you know, a major step mm -hmm. forward here. Um, so I found what you, all three of you were saying very interesting. And thank you, too, because as I walked into this room, I happened to sit next to Nancy Naismith, who was one of my first bosses when I was way back at the Office of Technology Assessment for the ref uh, first report that I directed, which is on issues in renewing. Can you hear me? Am I talking okay? I think you need to hold the microphone okay. really close. Up. So anyway, yeah. this is my first boss, or close to it, at the Office of Technology Assessment. I started there exactly 30 years ago, 1982. So it's great to see her here, too. But um, I wanted to comment, I guess. Um, well, Lorelai first just asked if I'd say a few things. We met for a drink last week, and we were talking about the role that OTA played. 
um, not a, obviously in utilizing technology, but in trying to understand issues that, in a way that uh, might help to move Congress forward. And so I guess some of the things I was hearing today were about how to use technology for advocacy or to be heard you know, by your member. Um, OTA is the other side of the coin, or was the other side of the coin, where um, we actually weren't allowed to advocate anything. OTA was set up to analyze and assess various issues with technology at its core, but then look at all the other associate, associated issues, economics, the political side, the national security side, whatever, and try to make sense in a nonpartisan way so that all members and their staffs would be able to be better informed about whatever debates they were going to enter, enter into or when they're reading their constituent mail or when they do click, click and there's a number, but then you do click, click on another site and there's a different number, you know, and how do you start to make sense out of all of that? So there were three things that came to mind while we were talking and um, what to me was the essence, but Nancy will correct me if I'm wrong, First, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment was a creation of Congress itself. It was created by Congress by public law, 92 or whatever it was, um, in 1972. Um, it was created with a bipartisan board of um, six, uh, 12 members of Congress, half Democrats, half Republicans, half House, half Senate, who had to approve any full report before it could even be started. And then any report that we did, including, or certainly in my experience, I'm sure there were some experience, uh, you know, exceptions, but all of the reports I either directed or worked on had to be requested by at least two full members of Congress, usually the chairman and ranking minority member of, you know, whatever relevant committee, but it could have been um, anywhere, I believe, usually more requesters. Um, but it had to be one Republican, one Democrat before we could get started. So the first part was by just by structure and by purpose. OTA had to be bipartisan. The second part of that was we were deliberately set up not to advocate, but to better inform and to help structure a debate so that we could give all the the hardcore information out there and we could show what we knew and we could show what we didn't know and try to sift through the debates, narrow it down, so that the discussion could be a little bit more founded in substance and a little straightforward. And I will say in one of the, um, the reports uh, that I was working on in the mid-'80s on, you know, my, I'm a Soviet expert by training, and we were looking at what a Soviet offensive into Europe would look like and doing a big report on new technologies for NATO you know, that was tied into some legislation going up to the Hill. And lo and behold, we get uh, Jack Gibbons, the head of OTA, gets a letter from, um, from uh, the commander of the U.S. Army in Europe, General Otis, responding to the one part of the report that I had really been grappling with, which was there were certain things we just didn't know. So we added, added a section. What do we know and what don't we know? about Soviet military whatever. And he singled that out with a big thank you to Jack, saying that was a really useful, you know, thing, uh, a document for them to have. So I guess that le leads to the third point, which is while our mandate was to better inform Congress, in fact, these reports um, ended up being used in so many different parts of government, and I went on to be a professor, I certainly assigned them, you know, and, and uh, to better inform the public and state and local governments as well. I think in the same letter, he said he wanted to use that as the primer, you know, for new recruits coming into the army, whatever, out in Germany. So um, I guess those three, th three things were the three things that Lorelei just picked up on, that it seemed to us the question is, is first, to get the information to members of Congress and staff and, you know, and uh, committees and whatever. But second, having worked on the Hill for a decade and having heard your first comments, we don't have time, certainly members don't, but staff don't either, to really understand each issue in depth. And 
that's the additional component that comes with utilizing technology to better inform. It's then how do we begin to put that information together in a way that will not just advocate, but actually inspire some kind of dialogue in a, in a Congress that's pretty deadlocked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any responses first? Uh, if, if not, we'll, we can move to general Q&A. Thank you. I think that was a great overview. Um, and I, I might say I've, d I've conducted dozens of interviews with staff, uh, both on Capitol Hill and in, um, and in district. And the most useful insight I hear repeatedly in different ways is like, we don't have a problem with information. We have an information overload. It's very specific types of knowledge that we need. And this is the sort of the spectrum that we were looking at is sort of between s sentiment and, and substance. Um, and what they lack are things like uh, uh, foresight an analysis, comparative analysis, uh, contextual analysis, institutional memory, um, real-time uh, expertise, so fact-checking, uh, peer-reviewed knowledge, that kind of information. And also sort of a lack of connection between local entities. I guess in, in, in an engineer's mind, this is distributed knowledge, collective intelligence. How do we reap, harvest, optimize that while we have a chance, unlike any in, in the past? How can we do that moving forward? Uh, so I'll go ahead and, um, and take uh, the first question. I'm going to be a kind of strict moderator. I'm going to actually move back over here so I can check on um, the hashtag. But would you like to go ahead, Todd, right up here in the front row? Hi, I'm Susie Kim from the Washington Post. Um, so I was wondering if, given the degree of information overload and this sort of environment in which, um, I think as, as Nancy mentioned, it, it, there isn't the time to understand each issue in depth, does this leave uh, a space or a role um, for lobbyists uh, to sort of come in and, and, and from their perspective, they're offering sort of expert knowledge and, and perspective from you know, from an industry's perspective or whatever group they're advocating for. Um, and, you know, is there a potential upside and sort of downside um, to the role of, of lobbying, um, uh, you know, in sort of the, the conventional way that we understand it? Does anybody want to take that? Sure, I'll take a stab okay. at it. Um, so, I mean, I think that that is a legitimate concern. I can say, both from my perspective at CMF and from my time on the Hill, that the role of lobbyists is, um, it's, an easy bo it's an easy boogeyman, um, to be perfectly you know, fr uh, frank about it. Having said that, I mean, I know from when I was working on the Hill that there were lobbyists who, I, I mean, I always checked against other sources, first of all. Just because someone was easy, you know, was the first person that picked up the phone, that wasn't going to be the last word. You know, I'd um, always weigh it against someone else. And um, that I always uh, took into account, it whenever possible, would reach back out to my counterparts in the district to fact check what I was hearing. You know, get, and the people who were the most effective were those campaigns that brought those together. So they would have a good, like you were talking about, what's the impact in the district? How is this actually going to play out? Um, is the lobbyist someone who's just in DC and doesn't have a good understanding of the impact in the district? Or are they someone who re represents a larger association? And there is actually something that resonates with the constituents. Um, so I, and I know that um, Lorelai's gotten the applause lines before for standing up to Jack Abramoff. So I think she's actually uh, um, in the same room. So I think she's probably better equipped to answer this question than I am. But um, absolutely, you know, that, that's a part of it. I was actually laughing when Nancy was talking about, you know, you find the numbers on one site and then you go find them on another site and how disruptive it can be and how hard it is to filter the information when you realize that the person with the best, I don't know how many tech geeks are here, I know I've got one to my left, but uh, am I, I'm married to one, um, but whoever has the best uh, search um, engine optimization, SEO, becomes as important as having the right facts, and that's not good. If your results show up first, um, that that's, shouldn't be who uh, carries the day. The, the only thing I would say in, in that Abramoff conversation um, was, uh, in a book event, um, and I agreed a lot of with what he said, but it was making the case over and over again that this institution is just sort of corrupt and venal. And, and I think that we need to make the case that it is less corrupt and venal than it is obsolete and incapacitated. I mean, in this case, 
if you look at Congress, like as your grandparents who uh, are of another era, it cannot hear uh, what we want it to hear. We, we need to adjust and evolve and sit back and take a bigger look at that. Um, and actually, the audience in that room actually really appreciated that. Um, dare I say, it was a bunch of Congress lovers. You can only say that in, in Washington, D.C., but I think that's important to point out, is that it, it's, you can't just blame this all on corruption. I mean, lobbyists play a very useful role. They are experts. They are present when you need them. You know exactly who's paying their salary. They often point out the whole spectrum of issues at play. Um, and so I think the question is, how do we broaden that information playing field? And I can also say, just one last point on that. One thing I would always ask every lobbyist is I'd say, okay, I'm listening to you. What's, your, what's the opposition going to say? And if they couldn't accurately portray that to me, they'd say, you know, and in an honest way, then I wouldn't, I would discount a lot of what I just heard if I didn't feel like they were, rep you know, it's not their job to represent the other side, but it's certainly their job to understand the other side. Yes. Um, uh, okay, go right there, and then we'll move back up here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Pete Shutley, and I'm from Brookings. And I think it would be helpful if we had a clearer statement of the issue or the problem, because we've heard several different ones from the panel. Is the issue that advocacy groups can't send thousands of messages to Hill members and that are then received accurately? Is it that staffers are swamped with information and can't process it? Is it that they don't have the right kind of information? Is it all of the above? Or, or what's the definition of the problem? Point one. Point two, I would turn it around and say one mega definition of the problem, of a mega problem, is the American public's lack of understanding of the Congress. If you asked you know, the average American, who's your member of Congress, you'd probably get a 10% response rate. Some of these public opinion polls that just came out recently, Pew said that 43% of the American public, after the Supreme Court decision on health care reform, had no clue. 8% had the wrong definition, 35 didn't even know that there was a definition. So the public's understanding of the Congress is, I would say, a much more serious problem aggravated by the decline of journalists that are the correspondents in Washington who are shrinking, paper, newspaper journalists, that have closed their Washington office. So the American public ignorance, I would say, is probably at the top of the problem. I'm going to go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you that there are a couple of issues we're, I think, raising in this forum, uh, none of which can be covered in the limited time we have. Um, but uh, I, I mean, and I agree with you also that constituents have a, a very low, uh, peop, American public uh, in general has a low understanding of, of the role of Congress and how they can influence Congress. Um, I can assure you, uh, we've, I've had calls from constituents who, have called to ask some really, you know, they're obviously passionate and, you know, asking really pointed questions, but it's about bills that my boss introduced 10 years ago or five years ago, which, you know, is not uh, relevant anymore unless he's, you know, reintroduced it in, in this uh, Congress. So, you know, the, the, yes, I, I think the public has to know more about how the Congress works, what, what, what it means to introduce a bill than having it reintroduce it in the new cycle. Uh, how a, a bill becomes law. Uh, it's a hugely, you know, it's a, as you know, a, a very much a long and involved process. House can do one thing, but if the Senate doesn't move an identical bill, it goes nowhere. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't become the law of the land. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a good point that, that we need to address that, uh, th that issue of, of really low understanding of, of, of Congress. And I think really it goes also back to the question of, of lobbyists. Um, you know, you do have a lot of pe uh, people, and some of the lob many of the lobbyists that I work with, just because of my issue areas, uh, tend to be human rights activists and advocates uh, who have a really deep uh, level of understanding on, you know, an issue uh, in, in country X or, or Y, and, and they are uh, lobbying uh, on, on the human rights issues uh, related to that. And, you know, I, I would say that's very different from, you know, having a lobbyist from a major, 
you know, law firm who comes in and, you know, has this beautiful bill ready, you know, ready to be dropped virtually because they've written it with, you know, a lot of, uh, a bunch of lawyers who get paid a lot of money and, you know, there it is, it's all ready to go, you know, and, and, and so, you know, of course you have to be careful uh, and, and know where the lobbyist is coming from, but the point I think is uh, the American public uh, does not know that that's sort of what they're competing against. Uh, yet at the same time in our office we take constituent calls uh, very seriously and, and I know other offices do as well so uh, American people have a lot more power and influence than maybe they realize uh, when it comes to uh, affecting their legislatures uh, legislators uh, priorities so I think the other thing is just the evolution of citizen journalism and how more subject matter expertise can um, be availed to members of Congress back home in their districts and states. I think that's an evolving field. There's a media policy initiative here that's working on that. That's another piece of this. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Hi, my name is Kader Sandoval. Um, I was an IT consultant on the Hill for the last five years. And I was not working for one member. I was working actually for 35 and plus members on a non-partisan non, um, manner. Um, one of the things, I went through two congressional transitions and I experienced, you know, the exiting retiring members, I experienced the special election members leaving the Hill and I also experienced the incoming freshman members and, and all those situations. Um, when it comes to knowledge as to what you're referring to, I kind of look at it from a little different perspective. I look at it more from a data perspective as to how it's being handled in the technology. Now, a lot of times what I've noticed was outgoing members um, had huge databases that they were not necessarily leaving behind for incoming members. And the incoming freshman members would start off from scratch trying to get a lot of the knowledge. You know, that costs money, that costs time, that costs effort. My question always was, who actually owns this data? I mean, regardless of the content of this, of the knowledge that an office acquires during its time, who actually owns it? That's a fantastic question. It's interesting. Um, I was, just last week, I was, um, do, I was uh, doing a webinar. We started doing some, CMF has started doing some webinars uh, through a contract with the Chief Administrative Officer, um, and we are um, giving them to district staff. And, you know, we've talked quite a bit about DC-based staff and committee staff versus the personal staff. We haven't touched on the district staff and how that relationship works. And so they were talking about, and um, the session was on assessing casework. And they brought up a great question, which we hadn't considered that much. Um, and it's, it's similar, but not exactly touching on what you're saying. Um, and that is what happens when, a, when um, a member's district is dramatically changed by redistricting. So what happens, so you're in the middle of, um, you have a member of Congress, their staff is helping you on your uh, issue that's before the local VA. They are, that, all of a sudden, that military installment is, installation is no longer in that member's district. You are not going to have the case resolved by the time you start having a whole new set of constituents. What do you do? So, you know, so, and what it turns out, a lot of, you know, the, so that we have a chat box going while they're talking and they're firing off all these questions. That's a great, you know, what's going to happen? How do you handle it? And, you know, the ethics office is, um, is kind of silent on it. It says, you should only serve people who are your constituents. That's really helpful. Um, then it also, so what they, a lot of offices were saying what they did is they sent out notices to everyone who was no longer going to be in their district if they were worried that there would not be a process, um, you know, a responsible dispensation of the case prior to a new member taking over. And they reached out to the um, new member and then they reached out to other people and asked them if they could get a waiver to transfer their information to, um, to the new member of Congress who would be taking over that information or already sitting member of Congress but taking on new constituents. And so that to me was a very responsible situ way of handling it. Um, but you know, you have awful situations, you know, where, and they're understandable. You know, people are um, upset when they lose a seat. They are not happy about the redistricting process or they're just so busy dealing with the ongoing problems that they just don't ever think about a responsible way to transfer it. I wish I had a better answer for you, but it's something that we're thinking we need to look into a lot more thoroughly. You know, um, we don't make recommendations. We go out and find out kind of what the problems are and then talk with congressional offices about how they have collectively tried to solve it. We see that more as our role, but um, it's a great issue to raise. And that's a very concrete example of how this ends up impacting things. But it still doesn't answer your big question about what is the problem. 
I think it's that we have antiquated systems trying to deal with remarkable challenges. I th that's <laughs> kind of a broad uh, definition of it. Tom, did you want to comment on that? Is sure, the technology the problem question. Um, I, oh, I mean, I, I can address the IT question a little bit. Uh, my, uh, my understanding is that typically an office will leave, the uh, for instance, a CRM database, the database of, uh, of casework to the, the next um, the, the, the member that you know, wins the election if they're outgoing. Um, and this is, uh, I, this, is, uh, this is a fact in that, or my experience with this is that uh, this is, it's part of the reason why some CRM vendors, some software vendors, so they all use these software systems to manage correspondence, um, are more entrenched because there's a, um, there's a big incentive for um, um, a member to continue to use the database uh, and system they already have in place because it's such a, a giant um, hassle, such a, a large IT uh, problem to migrate. Now, technically, they have to be able to. It's one of the requirements of a CRM to be able to migrate that data set. But in practice, if you're a new member of Congress, you haven't, uh, you're new to all of these problems, the last thing you want to do is um, add that, uh, the complexity of changing your constituent management system or your, um, your CRM platform uh, as one of the first things that you do uh, in office. So um, I, that is a little bit different. There are also um, accounts. There's uh, leadership roles uh, that, and, and so email lists that correspond to offices or websites that correspond to like, the majority leader, et cetera. That stuff um, is there, I, I think it, 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 it depends. Uh, yeah, like yeah. you sign up for your newsletter, you're not going to pass that. That out. stuff you know, doesn't get likely. passed on, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but as far as the, uh, the larger, um, the, the question about the larger problem, I think Lorelei did a great uh, job summarizing that in her description of the panel. You know, we have an institution that is, has technically, has antiquated technical infrastructure. Obviously, that's just a small part of the problem, but it's a legitimate part of the problem, and that's exacerbated by the fact that budgets are, have been cut in the last two years uh, significantly. Um, and, uh, and the, uh, and, but I think that, uh, that, that that's looking at it you know, uh, that's the, on the institutional kind of infrastructure side, and that's where my expertise is. But the only reason that we've been able to do anything, and I think we have made progress, um, and I've seen other, um, other uh, initiatives that, uh, that I would describe as very um, uh, progressive in the apolitical sense of that term. Uh, uh, for example, open data. There's an initiative to open up legislative data in the House. This is happening. Um, this is happening in spite of the fact that they have uh, um, that 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 IT budgets are slashed, and uh, and the the reason this happens is you have people, uh, you have members who entrust staffers um, to uh, to in leadership positions to to make decisions that um, and that are for the good of the institution and, and are not you know for political expediency. And the, for example, the reason that we actually got our um, our, this, this, uh, not the black box project, but our correlate product, the um, the the system that uh, improves CRM um, functionality into the house at all, is because of um, this. Uh, the even though we initially were talking to um, Nancy Pelosi's office, it was uh, Eric Cantor's um, uh, chief or um, new media director Matt Lira who really pushed for that, and we've also done some subsequent work with him to increase. I completely agree that. The lack of of understanding of the public of the institution is is that's a really, uh, it obviously journalism is part of that problem, but there are things the institution can do. And one project that that is out of um, that I think uh, is really interesting that has come out of um, Cantor's office is a project called uh, Citizen Co-Sponsor, which is a um, it's a it's a, a legislative information system inside of Facebook that lets people explore legislation, and and that's a a, a nonpartisan effort. Um, uh, and I think that uh, the uh, that on the on the de on the other side, uh, or uh, there there are other project or products that we can talk about that are similar in terms of the way that they get done. Is you have people um, that are in Congress who believe in the institution, who are um, uh, who are pushing for for technical change. And I think um, this a, a product called PopVox that you may have heard of. Um, uh, there's something similar going on there. Uh, so. 
and I think the Committee on House Administration, the fact that um, I had barely started back at the Congressional Management Foundation, and they held an entire set, they held an entire conference on accountability and transparency in House information systems. Um, you know, that's, that would not have happened um, a few years ago. Um, and it was widely attended, and there were folks from the Sunlight Foundation who are great, you know, and we, you know, we had a presence there, and, you know, a lot of the different vendors, but, you know, um, advocacy groups were there as well, and it's, um, you know, and, and the fact, I mean, how much websites have changed since we first started giving grades for them, um, you know, back in the early 2000s um, to where they are now uh, with the Gold Mouse Awards, the number of, um, of sites that are eligible for a Gold Mouse Award, and a big part of that is the fact that they, ha that the sites have to be transparent and they hel help to hold members accountable. Um, that's, that's a revolution. It, they're still way behind the rest of you know, the, uh, the, popula um, the populace and the population. The, yeah, the, uh, the other thing I was going to say, just to, back to your larger question, um, when I worked on the Hill, what I noticed is that a lot of people who likely have the sort of public interest in mind and should be, I, I always thought, more involved are just not present in a useful way. And specifically, I mean academics, local academics, um, uh, land-grant universities, their mission is knowledge in the public interest. And I think people still think of el rural electrification and the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, when they think of land grant universities, I mean, where where are these high reputation, high validator, high highly credible filters of information? Bonus that they're in the district. Um, I think that's going to be a really interesting path forward. The institutional memory problem too. That's another role for citizens. That's another role for people uh, outside the institution is to maintain the institutional memory. Uh, nonprofits uh, are a great place to do that. I think that is a, a way to make themselves much more modern and useful for a legislature. And in terms of citizen journalism, something that people requested a lot is like just moving past this old stodgy press uh, model uh, that, that staff not only need typical press releases and lists now of sort of broadcast journalists and the newspaper journalists, but they want um, top tweeters in your district, um, top bloggers in your district, and press clippings of that, micromedia, hyperlocal news. A, a lot of it's going in, in that direction and to the extent that becomes sort of credible filtering mechanisms. Um, anyway, I, I talked to staff for a year and a half about this. They come up with amazingly innovative solutions. But a lot of it, again, it needs to be constituent driven. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Sheila Lal. I'm with the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, and I had a, two quick questions. The first is for Tom. Um, it's about like, uh, your organization's work. At, you do it at the federal level, but are you looking at moving it to the state level? Um, I worked at, in the Missouri House of uh, Representatives, and I know that our CRM is really awful. So uh, I didn't know if there was if you all were looking at what moving was it? down. Um, I don't really remember. It was just really bad. Because <laughs> this uh, is for all time. So no. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. We are. We have a pilot in New York State and a couple of state senator offices. Um, it's a. We're. Uh, we would like to, uh, but the. Um, uh, there, we're we're trying to determine how to scale it, and um, you know the the nice the it, the House and the Senate we're we're not in the Senate right now. Um, uh, both have you know pretty homogenous architecture, even though there are many different CRMs, and but uh, states have widely differing um, uh, si uh, CRM systems and also protocols for handling um, uh, questions like the question that was asked about data ownership. Um, uh, it it's just it's it. it really very state to state so but but um, the answer is we would like to yes okay, and then yeah. I had another question for Susie and Jessica um, you could talk a lot about how like social media is used um, for offices and how they like to get in touch with their constituents um, but I was I haven't heard anything about Skype or any like video services and uh, do you guys have any insights into how offices or representatives can use that um, do you want to tackle it first or? oh you go ahead yeah um, we looked at, I'm just trying to remember because I don't have my, I, you know, you, you become overly dependent on technology. You realize when you can't just turn to a slide and say, here's where they are on uh, video, um, you know, adaptation of video. In general, they've been much faster at adapting social media than they have, uh, you know, it took, it took them a long time to get up on running on blogs and, I mean, sorry, on websites and seeing them as anything more than a, um, you know, 
visit my website, you know, uh, the kind of quaint ones with the, the, where you still have it on the license plates, you know, or, um, with the forward slash dot gov. Um, but they, they've been much more quick, they've been much more quick to adopt um, social media. Um, YouTube, to some extent, and then one that I find fascinating, and I'm not sure how it's gonna play out. I had a, pre I had a group come in to present to me from VU. Um, it's it's V-Y-O-U. Um, and I was showing my age because I was asking them. I was like, oh, do you guys like Velvet Underground? And they were like, who? <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, VU is a, pr is a pretty cool technology where you kind of have a more controlled way of using YouTube. You can pose questions. And then um, you know anybody can pose questions. And then a member can decide if they're going to answer those questions in whatever format they want. And uh, Senator Grassley, and who's also a big Twitter, per, um, who uses Twitter, the Twitter a lot, as he sometimes <laughs> calls it. But anyway, he's been very innovative in adopting this, and he's been interested in VU. Um, so that's some video technology. As far as Skype, I've really been recommending it when I do some of the trainings with district staff, um, in particular, so that they can break down some of the walls between two, two factors. You sometimes have districts where they're very widespread. Um, so you know, if you're the at-large member for North Dakota, I mean, it's hard to stay in contact with those tiny offices, and they, get, they start feeling very isolated in the work that they're doing. And that's to say nothing of trying to connect back with DC. Um, because I make the point a lot with them, you know, to understand why their work they're doing is so important. They're on the front lines. If a piece of legislation hasn't been well crafted, then they're the first people who, see, you know, get the calls from constituents that it's problematic. And that's the sort of, those aren't experts, but they are experts because it's the law is impacting them, the regulation's impacting them. Um, so you know, I've been trying. I've been trying to really encourage them to adopt some of this. But I do know that there are some restrictions on whether they can use Skype at all. Um, and I haven't gotten very clear confirmation on what the laws say. I think they can use them in their district offices pretty broadly. I don't think they can use them in the D in the district office. I mean, in the DC office. But don't quote me on that. You. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad I just saw Dan Schumann come back in the room. Speaking of dragon slayers, um, <laughs> on uh, the issues of, of um, information, Congress, and the Sunlight Foundation. And would you go ahead and ask your question? He wrote a paper, I guess, about a, nine months ago now about staffing levels in Congress and, and comparative analysis in the history. And what I remember from it most is Congress is working approximately at 60 to 80 percent of 1979 levels of staffing, and the problem is worse where deep expertise is needed. Do you want to go ahead and... Oh, wait just one second, please. Oh, and I'm, I'm supposed to every once in a while adv uh, advise the audience watching on the web that we can take your questions with the hashtag OTISC. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, of course. So in, this follows off the sort of the, the question that the, the person from Brookings had, had mentioned, which is, you know, what is the point of, you know, what, what is the, the number of what we're trying to discuss? And it's really Congress's capacity to analyze and prioritize analyze information, prioritize what it's going to be doing. And we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years a diminution in its ability to do so. Uh, OTA was abolished. Uh, the Administrative Conference of the United States disappeared for, for a decade. CRS lost its economist. Uh, we've seen the deluge of information that's coming in through constituent communications resulting in a staffing up of legislative correspondence in the, in the resulting uh, weakening of uh, the policy folks. And of course, there's a shift of, of people from the DC office to the district office, which means that more and more people are engaging constituent service, which is absolutely fine. But at the same time, that's weakening the ability to, to deal with things, uh, to deal with important questions on uh, the congressional policy side. And so the question that I had for, for these, these uh, our eminent panelists really comes down to, so we've discussed, you know, um, uh, getting information from CRS, and we've spoken a bit about constituent communications. I'm sort of curious about Congress's role in making information, putting information back into the ecosystem, sort of the, of course I work at Sunlight, so the transparency side of this equation. Uh, the more, you know, from, from our perspective, the more information that's made available back to the public, you get things, for example, when I come and I lobby you or, or anybody else, uh, one, I'm working from sort of a level playing field, but you can also look at the sources of my information to see whether you trust what I have to say. But this, is, but this comes down to how is Congress making its legislative information available? How is it making its analyses available? Can you see the committee reports and the transcripts and things along those lines? And there are many sort of other things that factor into this equation. 
And I was just hoping that, um, that, that you guys could talk a little bit about um, what do you think would be helpful in terms of what's sort of the next step for Congress in, in sort of pushing information back out into the information ecosystem so that you can get better information coming back to Congress? So it's, it's a little bit of a, a complicated question, uh, but I, I'm, I know that you guys are up to it. <laughs> Um, sure. I mean, it's a very, you know, difficult question, as you said. I, I agree with you, um, but that that really, I think, is is also very important. Um, in terms of our office getting information out about my boss's wh what he does in Washington D.C., you know, um, you know, as you know, we, there are hundreds and thousands of votes that are cast uh, throughout the two years uh, that Congress is in session, and. Uh, that alone, you know, how to explain to constituents like why he voted a certain way. Uh, he, uh, we've, off, uh, we've had a couple of instances where he would vote, he would put an amendment into a moving bill like an appropriations bill uh, and, you know, obviously vote for it because it's his and then uh, vote down on the overall bill uh, because the overall bill is, is, is not, um, you know, in our, in our view, you know, uh, favorable. Uh, so how do you explain those things to, to people? I think, it, you know, it's just a good example of, of the complexity of the, what, what, what we're dealing with. And then I think constituents would also want to know, well, aside from voting um, and introducing legislation, which, as I said, you know, is a very long process. Sometimes it takes many years of trying to, to, for it to finally become law, or we, you know, sneak it in as an amendment to a moving bill. So, you know, people would say, well, you had a long bill, but now you put this dollar figure into a bill. So, you know, what's going on? So anyway, that, those are just some, you know, I think, uh, ways in which the public can easily be very confused and mystified about, you know, uh, any member or senator's activities. Um, and then not to mention sort of the, the quiet, you know, diplomacy that takes place uh, that nobody really knows about because it's, you know, private, uh, whether it's meetings with constituents or experts or, you know, others who uh, want to tell my boss their, uh, their views on, on important issues. So, um, and, and some of the things that my boss will do uh, and others will do regularly are things that will not, you know, be known by, by public, but maybe they should know <laughs> because he was an instrumental, you know, he played an instrumental role. Uh, role in, in resolving or moving, you know, the said issue. So um, I, I, I think that's a very good question. I, I mean, what, what we try to do is we try to identify people who we think will care about an issue. Um, a, a, a good example of this is, um, so my boss was involved in a, an issue related to Indonesia, uh, which, uh, you know, is the uh, largest Muslim democracy, third largest democracy has in Washington State and Indonesia has a very strong trade relationship. Uh, and there was some uh, issues earlier this year uh, regarding potential port closures in Indonesia and the impact that would have on Washington, you know, um, uh, agricultural products that uh, we export there. Um, and, uh, and, and Congressman McDermott also happens to be the co-chair of the Indonesia caucus in Congress. So he already had developed a lot of ties with the Indonesian government officials, the diplomats based in DC, and was able to uh, also work with his counterpart in the Indonesian legislature to really address it in that level and, and actually find uh, a very positive resolution to the issue. Uh, now, to try to explain that to, to folks in a, a cute soundbite, it would be really hard, you know, people would be like, well, okay, well, even then, like, what are we talking about? What's the scale of U.S. trade to Indo Indonesia? You know, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, issue, but, um, you know, I think that is the, the kinds of stories we want to get out to the relevant players, you know, in, in Washington State, in the Seattle, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce, and, you know, folks who deal with trade. So that is the job of staff, uh, really, uh, to, to, to make those calls and to explain the issues. Um, but, you know, it, it's obviously never going to be enough because, you know, as you heard, there's, you know, maybe 10 or in our office about eight full-time staff. Uh, you know, so it, it's, it's a lot of information that we should be getting out that maybe we just simply don't have the capacity to do. But the nice thing is uh, if constituents call or email or write to us asking specific questions about a bill or an issue, we write back to them and we give them an explanation. So that's, that's a sure guarantee of, of getting information. But I think what you're getting at is, is m a little bit more systematic. Um, I, I was really, you know, what can be done sort of institutionally? Uh, and there's, I know there's legislation in certain aspects to deal with pieces of this, and I was wondering if there were um, sort of institutional pieces that are missing 
that, that either need to be built or need to be strengthened. Like, you know, OTA was an example of one of those cornerstone pieces that is, sorry. You know, OTA was one of those cornerstone pieces that has disappeared. Uh, you know, uh, there are other, you know, and there was an attempt to bring OTA back in the last appropriates bill. Uh, there's legislation now to make CRS reports available to the public or to require all reports from the executive branch to be available online so anybody can look at them. You know, these are sort of institution building kinds of pieces. Mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, ha all the reports that CMF, you know, did for all those years, you know, f that are fantastic in terms of giving you insight into term over within congressional staff and how that affects you. Know, that is an important institutional piece that is, um, you know, sometimes falls by the wayside. Uh, so, you know, it's really what is sort of that between the member level and, uh, you know, Congress as a whole, is there something that, you know, that, that you think should be done or, or could be done as sort of a next step to sort of strengthen uh, these kinds of connections, this kind of information sharing. One of the things I'll just mention is I've seen members using their personal websites as sort of hubs for system-wide knowledge dissemination. Um, there's one actually up, a really interesting one on the, how the majority a website of the House Armed Services Committee that's called a sequestration um, resource package. Of course, it's, it's very one-sided in that sense, but it's an interesting way to use a highly um, sort of a, an institutional uh, online venue to share knowledge. I, I think the other things I've seen are members posting constituent written expert uh, documents on their websites. Like uh, there was a wonderful one on Zoe Lofgren's website during the SOPA debate that was written, I believe, by some lawyers in Silicon Valley which explicated the acronyms of the conversation and was so helpful. Apparently it went viral on the internet and that's the kind of thing, again, that experts who usually don't see themselves as in important validators, filters, um, and contributors to the policy process uh, that I think need to maybe sort of look at this new division of labor of citizenship. And I just might add, too, one of the things that's happening in the institution as a whole is the deliberative process of Congress. This is super geeky, so let's put our... Congress geek hats on, is the difference between the authorization process and the appropriations process. The authorization process in Congress is severely lacking right now as a deliberative fora. It's where the big ideas, the risk taking, the sharing, uh, and the contributions of experts uh, th thrive and prosper. Over the last 20 years, Congress as an institution has migrated a lot of that expert substance into the, appropri into the appropriations process. So it's kind of going straight to where the money is. It's not doing its institutional job of, of deep um, contemplation and, and inclusive uh, deliberation or collaboration. That's something that can be in, uh, incentivized from the outside, too, by people coming from the district and saying, how can we create venues for you to talk about this? Not town hall models, not shaking hands in parking lots, but informed convening in districts. Yeah, and, and I'd love to see that. And, you know, if, like, what you, I mean, what I, the website that's in my brain is basically, you know, you would have the straightforward content, but there would be a way to navigate through it depending on what you're interested in and that you would get down to the level of process and so that you would actually, so if you're only interested in going this far, process isn't sexy. So not everyone's going to want to do that deep, that deep dive, but you would, there would be avenues through which you would, so I'd love to have a further conversation because we're looking at, we'd love to redo um, the Gold Mouse Awards and, inc and include a lot more social media discussion in there. And we're calling it, and in my head, it's called Congress Online Reboot. And so, you know, what those criteria should be is, I think that that's a big part of that conversation. Where we, I, I'm calling it like a virtuous feedback loop. You know, that's what would be ideal. And the, the ecosystem would be healthier because you'd be getting new information through and everyone would be you know, sunlight is a great antiseptic, and so, you know, it would actually be a cleaner system. I don't know. Anybody else? Should we go ahead and, did you have a, thank you. If you could identify yourself also, that would be great. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Olga Musayev. Um, so I, I find this very interesting, sort of, you know, this big problem, uh, but it seems like it's certainly not limited to Congress. Um, you know, information overload is sort of everywhere, um, and I guess the most, you know, most prominent example of that is the internet itself. Uh, how do you identify websites that are credible? How do you identify websites that have good information uh, or the, the information that you're looking for? Um, so I'm curious, has there been any effort 
search, you know, the, okay, so the way that search engines do it is by crowdsourcing, by, you know, instead of, uh, uh, but by letting voters, like users, vote on what's the most relevant, most, you know, unbiased information. Um, so is there, has there been any effort to have, you know, Congress, instead of going out there and identifying the people who are stakeholders in this, just put the information out there for anyone to correct. So, you know, a lobby submits uh, a letter and that's just posted somewhere. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the other, the opposition or anyone who's interested can edit it. And if it goes through the process unchecked, you know, then the congressman knows that it is credible, uh, that it has been out there in the public and that it is, you know, you can rely on it. Uh, so I'm curious, has there been any effort to, to go in that direction? Thank you. Sort of I think the Madison platform that Mr. Isa put out there is something similar. It's called the Madison uh, platform. It's uh, uh, Chairman Isa. Uh, if you go, if you just Google it, <laughs> you can you can find that. Is any any other examples that you can think of? There was there was UCut that was one of the things that Mr. Cantor did having citizens sort of vote on what they'd like to see out of the budget, but it was kind of a blunt object. It's not a very refined um, effort yet, but these I think are what's out there to be innovated around right now. Um, any, any comments? I also got a comment in just saying it, it's interesting how search engine optimization can be as important as lobbying <laughs> when influencing <laughs> Congress. <laughs> Is that right? If you want to comment on that. Any? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, I, I think that the uh, um, I, I th that that both of the examples that you just gave um, uh, are uh, you know interesting examples of crowdsourcing. But the idea of crowdsourcing of having a of of effectively you're talking about the idea of a Wikipedia for um, for like policy briefs and uh, um, and and uh, lobbyist information. That that's a that's an interesting idea. I. Uh, my generally the, the uh, also just to kind of address what um, what Daniel was saying or uh, that uh, there's a I think that there's this emphasis on open data on open raw data it's what I think about as uh, someone that's uh, involved um, in uh, congressional IT infrastructure but also uh, thinking about data um, and peripherally involved in open data projects and I think that there will be and has been great progress in that area. Sunlight has been, you know, really uh, has been putting pressure on the institution, and uh, I, and I think that it will continue to that enterprise that will continue to improve, and uh, we'll have. I, I'm optimistic about it. But but what is it's interesting, um, you know, sitting on this panel listening to the questions, it's clear that there is a lot that the the, the next level is is um, thinking about the information generation capacities of the institution. And uh, you know, if if it's going to be able to handle this, you know, increased amount of um, what what happens with open data? Open data gets uh, gets uh, used by advocacy organizations. It gets used by um, by uh, by lobbyists. It gets used by academics, and then is turned around into um, you know turn and 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 presented back to the institution. So the uh, improving the analysis capabilities of the institution is very very interesting, and uh, it, and I look forward to. Um, the day when you know open data is a given, and these uh, more um, high-level uh, discussions, uh, you know, hopefully they'll be the budgets and the capacity of the institution to have them. Um. Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Um, let's uh, go back there, and then we'll come back up here. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Stuart Miller. Um, I. We notice how software has got now got the ability to do some really amazing things with content as depicted by market trading software. Uh, the Economist recently had an article on several projects that are being developed right now to predict civil unrest by, observe, by looking at content, not just Twitter conversations, but a variety of content. Seems to me there's a big opportunity here, and I just wondered if there was any similar software development or act research going on that's addressing this, this issue of how to assimilate and synthesize multiple sources of co comment and opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Huh? And thank you for sending us. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. So are there, is there anybody out there that's... I, there, there, are, there are platforms. Um, there's something called Palantir, which sounds similar to what you're describing. Um, or, you know, it's a very, very uh, rich 
and uh, powerful uh, data um, analysis system, and it's used in the defense, um, you know, it, across def defense organizations. Um, and uh, I, I, but you know, I don't. It's in, would be it's an interesting question to. Are, do any con congressional offices have Palantir? I would probably say it's very expensive, so uh, probably not. Yeah. There's, there's other ones. I was at the Tech at State um, and the Transparency Camp, actually, that Sunlight Foundation puts on every year. If you want to look through, those are all online, the people who participated. There was a couple of people doing something similar to what you just suggested at the last one I went to, the UnConference. Um, it's called Politi Ear, I think. There's a California group out of Berkeley that's looking at ways to sort and filter and show the trends and the patterns uh, and what you're talking about, social media sites. Oh, right here. I'm sorry. The, oh, only thing, the only thing I want to add just kind of in general, and I don't, right. I don't have data to back this up, but generally speaking, where a lot more of the innovations have been have been around people's opinions as opposed to substantive policy ideas and exchange and I think when you were talking about what the big question is I to my mind that's part of it I'm not framing it well but that's a big part of it is that there's a lot of information out there and a lot of it is based on opinion and not facts and that was part of the role of OTA um, and I don't think that there's anything that really yeah, I think I mean, the way we look at it is that there's uh, the social media is being, being used a lot for uh, pressure and post-mortems of uh, but not process <laughs> I didn't mean that for to be alliteration, but so <laughs> I think that like seeing how this impacts the you know the optimizes the process of policy making is like is there ways are there ways to do uh, real time fact checking in hearings now that there are webcasts there is a group of of distributed climate scientists working on this right now I know. But is there a way to for the, the who those of us who are sort of worried about this big picture long term outcomes can create a continuing education system for members of Congress back home in their district simply by creating a better ability to surge and plunge and turn and respond with substantive expertise. And this, you know, I think, you know, we have taught a, a recently graduated PhD. If you want to say what is peer-reviewed knowledge, I mean, this is important and it seems to get lost a lot. It's rigorously determined knowledge. It's really important for long-term outcomes and it's something that isn't available in a useful way in Congress right now, just to be put it simply. Is that, is that, is that a, good, uh, a good definition of peer-reviewed knowledge? <laughs> Robust knowledge, <laughs> thanks. We're putting your PhD to use. Um, go ahead. Hi, um, Bilal Ahmed with Link Tank. Uh, we've sp spoken a lot about um, um, information technology used for, for constituent relations. Um, in managing that, but what about just the, the nature of, of, of partisanship and misinformation? It doesn't seem like technology is helping in any way and rather exacerbating a platform to, to advocate further partisanship. Where, where does that play into just Congress in of itself as a deliberative body? Thank you. That's really important. You want to go ahead and anybody who's had experience on Capitol Hill being on the receiving end of this, I think it's really important the noise problem. <laughs> um, I mean, I th that's, that's a big issue. Uh, I think there, it's easy to um, use websites uh, and, you know, blogs and other types of, you know, communication on the web uh, to attack, uh, mischaracterize, or, or uh, you know, put false information forward. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I can't say that in my work um, I have, uh, you know, uh, necessarily been the victim uh, of that sort of thing, um, in part because I'm, as staff uh, we're pretty much invisible. Uh, this is pretty unprecedented to even speak on the record. I never do this. Uh, and staff are strongly discouraged from speaking <laughs> on the record uh, because, you know, we work for our bosses. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think y your questions. Um, I mean, it might be helpful to have had more staff members on this panel who maybe have different experiences to, to weigh in and kind of share insights with you. But, uh, um, you know, I think members try their best to uh, inform their constituents and, and their, um, uh, who they perceive to be stakeholders. Uh, 
to best position themselves and best explain their views uh, and to be very uh, relevant uh, to sort of the national uh, discussion and national debate on the issues of the day. So um, sometimes partisanship, you know, I think uh, it can be used uh, to kind of further prove your uh, sort of, you know, position, uh, solidify your views and and totally discount the other side as being, you know, too naive or misinformed and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, I think in, in that sense, perhaps both parties at fault. But I think to a large degree, members of Congress really try to focus on, um, you know, being as accurate as possible. Uh, at least that's what I would like to believe. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do know from being on the Hill for the last four years that partisan attacks have increased uh, a lot. Uh, so you don't have to look very far to, to see, you know, some comments uh, about members uh, that, you know, especially during the campaign cycle that we're in now, you know, a lot of information I'm sure is going out there uh, that uh, perhaps is, is not the best characterization of, of that member's positions. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's uh, more of a feature of, of the current polarized environment that, that is Congress. Um, and. Uh, you know, I think members are in a difficult position of, of trying to retain some civility in the dialogue, but at the same time not seeming like they're completely weak, you know, and not able to defend themselves, you know. So they have to go out and say, My con that, that's wrong, you know, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party is mischaracterizing that position. Uh, so, you know, I, I could think of a couple of issues off the top of my head, for example, during like the women's reproductive rights, you know, abortion, th that kind of debate that have ensued over the last uh, couple of months, you know, a lot of partisan rhetoric, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you saw that play out, um, you know, um, and on other issues as well where, um, you know, I think members are using all venues, including social media, to really get their point of view across, but uh, I, I don't think that's ultimately helpful, so. Sure. Um, so I'm seeing, we're seeing a lot from, sorry, um, from groups, uh, nonprofits like Sunlight, and using data for pushing a point. And we don't see that in Congress. We're not seeing infographics. We're not seeing the use of in technology as much as from outside to, to promote a point. And it's still like a lot of rhetoric. That's, that's just the issue. I think I, that, I you know, they're not exactly early adapters on Capitol Hill. And I think that, that one of the things to keep in mind is that I think if a member of Congress had some help with visual data from constituents, this is another thing where sort of uh, keep in mind the, the gatekeepers of information in Congress are 25 and the end users are 65 about. The, how, do we, how do we act as custodians of that generation gap on the Hill on behalf of the institution? These are the kind of really important questions that, like by omission, um, I think people lump it into, uh, uh, I think disinformation campaigns can be so successful. Uh, a part of that is because um, there's so much uh, there's so much cash in the system right now. I mean, members having to spend so much time raising money instead of becoming experts. And as we've heard, the deep pools of policy knowledge have also declined over the years. Like, I guess my question for deep pools of knowledge that exist to uh, help the public's interest back in states and districts, they have a special responsibility right now. Uh, uh, where are some sort of student teams who can help with visual data for the institution? Um, Congressional Research Service is beloved by staff, but it's still a pretty academic, old-fashioned model. Um, how about creating visual data for the top 10 requested CRS reports? If they would put them <laughs> online and make them available. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of, I, I guess what I would love for people to do is, is again, just the assumptions uh, lots of times get blown up in, in the press. Um, but from what I've seen, and I hope this isn't naive as well, is that there's this triage system and that uh, money and noise might help something get past the triage system, but it doesn't inform the policy very well. And in fact, they might have reached their point of diminished returns, which is the saturation point, where it's not helping the, the institution move forward. Uh, uh, with the postmortems on the SOPA debate, we might, we might see some of that information coming out. Nancy, did you want to comment on that? I just saw you. No. Oh, okay. The, I think we only have a couple more minutes. If, if, how about if I give you all a chance to, to say last words or what we hope comes out of this or what might come next? I, uh, I'm hoping this will be a series 
of conversations, and so we're open for new ideas. You can also check out our blog and the OTI website here at New America Foundation to see what we're up to. Uh, the OTI tech team is growing rapidly and does a lot of international work, a lot of civic technology, a lot of technical um, expertise is available here as well. And we're sort of trying to look at these hard next steps. The, um, uh, the difference between campaigning and governing, the use of social tech, uh, you know, the, that's something that we've been all been asking in this town for the last couple of years. There's a book by Clay Shirky called Here Comes Everybody that is a lovely, easy read. And he talks about something called the difference between stop energy and start energy. And stop energy in the realm of technology and social media is sort of getting rid of a dictator or um, killing legislation. Start energy is much more difficult. It's the standing process of substance. Okay, so synthesize the last hour and a half conversation that, uh, uh, that I've been having for 15 years, uh, usually over cocktails though, that's the uh, <laughs> downside here. I don't think I can do that, um, but uh, I do see this very much as a conversation. I see it as a conversation starter. Um, I will be happy to share my business card with anybody, which is also remarkably old fashioned of me. But um, uh, you know, if anybody that would love to come up um, and have a further conversation, we're always looking for new um, research ideas is um, and any, if there's any funding attached to it so much the better but um, we you know I, I would welcome that and I'm glad that there are so many people here interested in this and I think that um, Laurelized challenge it's like I said it's a lot easier to stop something than it is to start something if people have creative ideas or they see something that a member of Congress is doing that's innovative that should be replicated um, we are happy to blast that out to the extent that we can happy to share it with other district offices when we meet with them and um, I wish everybody good luck in trying to conquer this. And if somebody can actually come up with a concrete definition of the problem, that would be great too. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, I think the last question is interesting and, uh, and, and um, worth just addressing very briefly uh, and then in light of the, the, the whole conversation. There is this tension between, techno between governing and campaigning and, uh, and also this lack of, of funding and, uh, and societal investment in the institution. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but I think that, uh, that obviously technology can be used in the process of you know, campaigning uh, for partisan purposes. And this happens while the uh, members are, 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 um, are in their position as, uh, as, um, as uh, of governing. And, uh, but, and so technology is very powerful as a campaign tool, but it's also critical um, uh, for governing um, in the presence of this, you know, what we've been talking about today, information overload and uh, lack of capacity to deal with and process that information. So I look forward to uh, the, you know, further development of technological innovation in these discussions and, and hopefully um, it'll be, uh, um, uh, this will be a fruitful series. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, I, I also was taking a lot of notes throughout the event uh, today because I was, I was, it was a very uh, thought-provoking conversation and it left me with a lot of things to think about uh, on my way back to the office today. Um, I, I guess one thing I just want to say in response to what you were saying earlier about uh, you know, information production, um, you know, things like Pony 2012, that video, as, as you all know uh, and have watched, uh, you know, that, I think, those kinds of things uh, are so helpful um, when members of Congress and, you know, I think uh, senators also see that uh, in, in, in terms of relating a complicated issue to, uh, to ordinary Americans. It's like, here's why you should care about something that's going on halfway across the world. Um, you know, and, and if we have academics in local institutions and universities and, you know, scholars who have, you know, innovative ways of, of helping us explain to the American public why something matters, you know, I think visual aid is always a great way. Uh, and I think that's why members of Congress, when they go speak on the floor, they try to always bring something, you know, and, and usually it's like, a pie chart or something that you can't read. <laughs> it takes like font is so tiny, and you know it, it's 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 just um, madness. But um, so clearly we need help uh, in in kind of communicating in, in more visual, more powerful, uh, visceral ways uh, that for the public to to connect with us. And, and so uh, I think there's a lot uh, of of great ideas that uh, that people are thinking about collectively here today. And I'm uh, really glad uh, to have been a part of the discussion. So 
Thank you. Thank you. So I think the message is out there. Your help is, is gladly received and appreciated. And people up here are all open for ideas and hoping to move forward on this. Thank you all for coming. Uh, again, there'll be some papers coming out in this Smart Congress project. And check our website for updates. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>